Hello, I'm Kiara Fry. I'm a broadcast reporting major at Point Park University, and I'm here at our Center for Media Innovation. Every day, women and men, our loved ones and our neighbors, risk their lives, limbs, and we've learned their mental health, all for our sake. Here at the Center for Media Innovation, we explore the future of journalism. We wondered whether the major networks will be the main way we learn veteran stories in the future, or will startup podcasts offer the best information? Is it only when we listen to a veteran on a stage or in person that we really understand? The conversation you're about to hear with veterans correspondent Quill Lawrence and others explores these questions. Note that it does include some graphic description and disturbing information as our military faces. Welcome um, to this conversation about veterans reporting disabilities, podcasting. We'll try and touch as much of all of this as possible. Um, we're at the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University. We're downtown. It's not raining for like a minute. It won't be raining, but it'll be raining like in 10 minutes. Um, I am, oh, we have a studio audience from Point Park University, some student staff, and somebody from uh, Veterans Affairs, which is really awesome. Thanks for coming. And uh, we have, I think, a Zoom audience. And then we'll also um, record this for later viewing. So I am um, Jennifer Shveta Jordan. I'm with Unabridged Press and I'm working with uh, Point Park here to integrate more people with disabilities in media work and um, veterans. There are some veterans who have disabilities. So that's how I, that's how this all started. And what we do is uh, work with people with disabilities who um, in workshops here at the university, uh, events like this and also uh, producing podcasts and YouTube video episodes. So I have these wonderful guests here who I'll now introduce. Um, I'll start with you, Sean. Uh, Sean Tyler, uh, Army veteran, Pittsburgher, New York native, New York State yes, native. Yeah. Um, you are with the Mission Continues, which yes. I'll ask you to talk about in a moment. Absolutely. Um, you're studying social work and you probably will graduate like in a month and a half. I will graduate in you, December. Yeah, I mean. Not probably. Yeah, <laughs> and hope, hoping to work at the VA uh, with uh, folks who have some substance abuse issues and, and uh, uh, some mental health. Substance, yes. Yeah. Um, I met Sean at the Veterans Breakfast Club Gala recently and um, have now been following him on social media and seeing some of his writing and um, poetry and, and just learning more about this interesting person that he is. <laughs> um, and next I will introduce Carmen, uh, who I met for the first time at what I call a kombucha bar. Don't tell I, people I, that. Don't tell people that. It was no, uh, street cred. That's, yeah. yeah, that's what I go, You can actually get other things. I just called a kombucha bar because that's why yeah, I get Yeah, my girlfriend takes me there. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, you are the author of Blindsided by the Taliban, a journalist's story of war, trauma, love, and loss. Uh, you were embedded with were embedded with an army unit in eastern Afghanistan when um, there was this explosion that uh, damaged your eye. And also, locally, post-industrial magazine mm -hmm. editor at large. So that's a cool thing. That's a startup in the last year. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Yes. Um, remotely, we have Russell Midori, which is like one of my favorite cakes, Midori cake. You're with us remotely from New York, CBS producer, formerly Marine Corps video producer, and now a founder of Military Veterans and Journalism. Right, okay. And here's Quill Lawrence. He uh, is the 2019 Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America Salutes Leadership and Journalism Award winner. It's a long It is long a very name long name, but it's, it's a wonderful honor. Um, Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you're also the veterans correspondent for NPR, formerly known as National Public Radio. I think so people just, still know it. Yeah, just to, but, but is, that's like not that's not okay to say, right? Like you internally, can say it. you can say it. Like, do, are people so like not. National Public Radio because you're really? I don't know. It's just NPR. Shorter. Okay. You want a three-letter acronym like everyone else? <laughs> so um, I I covered everyone, right? Sean, I'm just going to go back to you quickly and ask you to say more about the Mission Continues quickly. So, so the Mission Continues, it's a uh, national nonprofit organization, which is 
across across the nation and what what the focus is to bring veterans that are you know out of out of service back into service within the communities um, here in Pittsburgh we have three what's called service platoons and what we do is uh, we have service projects every every month within the three platoons and we go into the in the communities and like do different upgrades we have partnerships with so uh, the three communities is Hazelwood, which I run the Hazelwood platoon. There's the South Hills and Homewood. And what we do is, you know, have these partnerships within the community, find areas of interest that like that certain organizations want help with. And like, for instance, this Saturday, we're going to be my platoon is going to be in, in Hazelwood working on a church that we've been at since May, doing an upgrade of, of a once vacant lot, turning it into like a green space a play area, community area, and getting rid of some old uh, construction stuff from inside of the church. And we've been there for a few months, uh, like I said, since May, working on this church. And we have different events throughout, the, really three events at least every month with each of the three platoons. Yeah, I think that's that's awesome. I didn't know about that. And you told yeah. me that I could volunteer too, like yeah. anyone can. Yeah, and so like... And kind of like side, the the real mission is like I said to bring veterans into service, but also to like bridge that gap between the the civilian military divide. You know, one of the things like getting out of the getting out of the service, you lose that camaraderie, you, you lose that like sense of purpose, like outside of yourself, and like and you also think like oh like civilians are weird or whatever, and you realize you're more alike than you are different. You might have different walks of life, but like really, we're all there for, for the same purpose to make the communities better. And so, you know, it's a really cool thing. I've been involved with it since. So I moved to Pittsburgh last January, got involved with the Mission Continues last May, and then started the platoon leader position this January. So um, I think like, it's really cool. And yeah, and we, most of our, because since the civilian, you know, the, the non-veteran population, it by and far outnumbers the veteran population, we have more non-vets that are volunteering with us. And it's just a really cool atmosphere be a lot of really uh, you know awesome people from the communities and awesome veterans a as well. Nice, thank you. So come on out. And I, mm -hmm. and I feel like um, I don't know maybe I, I think I saw this on the website that I mean talking about disability and mental health um, that that is a way <laughs> to kind of redirect people's wonderful energy and service. Absolutely, and I, like strength. I was just talking talking to, with some people today at a at a VBC event, and it was like. You know, Mission Continues, it's not branded as a mental health program, but like that whole sense of service and sense of purpose, absolutely like volunteering. There's studies that have been done. I just recently did one like for a uh, graduate school research uh, class that was like, all right, how do you feel like after you've like from before you were in service, before you found like, you know, volunteering and after and like the numbers were like staggeringly different, like the sense of purpose, the, like the, the, the like, I don't want to say reason to get up in the morning, but kind of, yeah, you know, it, it just, you know, when you're not, not so focused on the things that aren't going well in your life versus how you can have an impact on the, the community at large, like it has a, a, you know, a symbiotic relationship. You're helping other people, but you're also helping yourself. So like I said, the Michigan News isn't branded that way, but it's absolutely like, you know, a secondary side effect of it. It is, it is a positive mental health thing. And you also mentioned the VBC, and I mentioned it earlier, the Veterans Breakfast Club, but um, just to give people a sense of um, what that is. You, you've done some work with them, Carmen. Can you maybe say what that is? Because I like the motto, healing through stories. Um, they seek to tell the stories of, of veterans going all the way back to World War II um, and uh, Global War on Terror veterans to talk about their experiences and to try to... Um, share those not just within their community but to get outside that community outside that veteran bubble to let people know um, that this very small percentage of a warrior class that we have in america um, is also an integral part of society and they have stuff to offer and they have they have di very different experiences and they have laid it all on the line for their non-veteran uh, fellow Americans. And this is this is something that they should be aware of and what those stories entail and what that sacrifice entails. Yeah, I it's like I went I've gone to a couple of their events. Um, Helen Fallon, who's in the room, um, is very connected with bringing them to the university. And the first event I went to was Korean War veterans last year. And they were they they get up and they tell their stories. Well, I think uh, you're the only one <laughs> who doesn't maybe know them because you're not local. Right. Um, 
and there's a history professor who is not a veteran, right? Um, who who draws these stories out of them, right. and it's it's amazing. He, I mean, I don't think he has a note while he's doing it, mm -hmm. you know. And he he just because he really connects with, he really listens to people's stories and then shares it with very large rooms of people, students here at the university, and, and that sort know, of thing. I, what I think is really interesting is that the the, civ, the civilian military divide you talk about is people think it's this giant wall if they know it's there at all. And it keeps people from asking a Korean War vet his story, that kind of thing. But uh, it's my job to just ask people their stories all the time. And people will say, wow, how did you get him to tell his story? And I'll say, I asked him, what's your story? And he told me, and no one had asked. It's not that he never talks about it. It's that, well, maybe it is, but it's also that people don't ask because they don't know how to ask or they think it's going to be scary or maybe... Uh, you know, they maybe he doesn't want to talk about it. Maybe you know, but d I trust me. These people, it, you're not going to remind them suddenly that they were in the Korean War. They know, and often I find people want to. They really want to tell their stories. Um, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and uh, like you know, one thing that I realized, like in my like transition and going through some tough times, is like when I didn't talk about it when like I like I kind of kept it like buried in my head was 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 the were the worst times for me and then finally when I like was like I need to get this out somehow whether it was through like poetry and doing slam poetry like live like that process for me was like like healing in and of itself and that's why like I'm a firm like I'm a firm believer in what Veterans Breakfast Club does and like just being able to have that dialogue whether it's like in front of an audience or whether it's just one on one with people you know, there's a saying in, in an organization I'm involved with, like, you're only as sick as your secrets. And, like, I think that that, you know, is, is very true when it comes to, t like, talking about war or talking about, like, tough things. Now, you have to, like, be cognizant of when and where you're talking about it. But, like, I do believe whether it's with a therapist or whether it's in front of a large group, like, get it out. Like, that's, my, that's how I, what I think about it anyways. Could you say more? So they're, they're, Veterans Breakfast Club is not just these in the room gatherings, but they also have a podcast that mm -hmm. I think you've been either consulting with or mm -hmm. can you say what that, that is? Uh, they're interviewing a number of um, veterans and some active duty uh, to, for them to tell their story about what life is like on the front lines or what it's like uh, to be a diplomat in a war zone. Um, we've spoken to folks who, uh, after their uh, military careers, have gone on to play professional baseball. Um, we've spoken to folks that have been the chief of staff to Colin Powell when Colin Powell gave that famous address at the UN with weapons of mass destruction in, that got us into the war with Iraq, uh, that faulty intelligence. Uh, we spoke to uh, Colonel Larry Wilkerson about his feelings about that experience and what uh, you know potentially horrors await us were we to say invade Iran. And we were sitting uh, in his living room in Northern Virginia talking about this. And I swear the hair on the back of my neck was standing up because he was just talking about in such great detail what a gigantic cluster F that would be if the U.S. were to get involved in that kind of war. If he said, you know, compared to Iraq, this would be, you know, it would be a day at the beach compared to what we would face in Iran. And so we're trying to convey to um, a non-veteran audience um, the real uh, what it's like to be on the front lines, but also you know the the real consequences of war. We see war play out on television, um, and it's and it doesn't even resonate with people the way um, I think that sitting down with somebody one on one and saying to them, "This is really what happens in these situations, and there are dire consequences not just for the guy next to you, but for all of humanity, really." And the podcasts are called the longest um, war. Is it's one called of them. it's called uh, Truth About War. Okay. Isn't one of the longest war? Is that what he's working on now? Or that was that, his previous that's edition. Previous. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting about you, Russ, because you're on um, Zoom. For me, I, so I'm the founder of Military Veterans in Journalism. We're pretty new, but we've made a lot of big strides early on. Um, we have a really strong mentorship program where we take veterans who are uh, newcomers to the industry and we pair them with really seasoned journalists. Veterans bring a diversity of experience, at, at least at least what I've seen in the newsrooms and such, um, that is really unparalleled. Honestly, <laughs> these veterans who don't go to work in journalism because it's too hard to break into the industry, they end up getting great jobs all over the place and they get paid much better. 
Um, and the pipeline, in, I, I don't know about your other other fields respectively as they relate to vets and disabled veterans, but look, if, at a major network news organization, the pipeline is full of very smart 22-year-olds who are all just a flat sheet of paper, with no offense to them, but, but you know, um, but, but this is a diversity issue that, that companies that companies should be looking at it, how they can improve their own diversity perspectives. And, and I think it starts with even them just saying, how many veterans work on your staff? We don't, nobody even says that. We, there's not even any data for that. Anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> we have CBS here and we have NPR and Sean, you'll never see any, either of them again, because you were telling me that you don't, don't watch the nightly that's, news. Well, I, yeah, I mean, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and could you talk about why? So, and it's not, like, not that I don't want to be like aware of what's going on. Like for me, it's almost like a, uh, a personal choice of like be involved with the things that I'm like super passionate about and the things that I can have like an impact on. Um, because time, my, I only have so much time and really like when i have when i have spent a lot of time like watching the news like i don't feel better about myself or about the world or whatever like i just don't feel better so long story short it's more of a mental health type thing versus a like i don't like the news just a lot of times like there's not i don't feel like there's enough like really good things being talked about like the positive things that are happening in the world and it's all this like you, you know divisive and then you know we can get into the politics and then that just you know yeah i appreciate that i'm a little bit the same way but i'm gonna say i always listen to npr like since i've been 17 and i heard it i just like happened upon it in the kitchen like i remember the exact moment seven in the morning and i'm like oh my god like why didn't anybody tell me about this we try to add light and less heat but give us a try yeah and i have and i, I, and I do enjoy it it's just not in my not in my rotation right now. I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it ever will be. Right. That's good. And yeah, my mom's listening to CNN, and it's like just like really loud in the car. And I'm like, can we just put NPR? It's just like <laughs> it's in a way I can handle it, you know, <laughs> handle the world. Good. So um, yeah. So thank you. But did um, either one of you want to respond to what Sean said just about like what do we do here in the media? We're we're just making people feel bad, or how do we how do we do better? Let's do what. So Sean will read. <laughs> so Sean, <laughs> I mean, not, Sean not knows how to read. read. Sean knows not how to I read. Don't. <laughs> you don't have the answer if you don't. I have to say, um, no, I've been getting a lot of feedback in the last couple of years from, and I'm always happy when I hear this from active duty military or the vets community, that they're still finding NPR to be a refuge where they don't have to hear, they're just not seeing sort of two people screaming at each other that there's an explanation and we try to shoot it right down the middle so i mean that's our goal if if uh if you can if you can or if you need to check out from the news i can totally understand that um but uh at the same time i think we make it a little too easy sometimes to check out of the news and that also relates to the, civ the civilian military divide we we're talking about where um, in this country, I'll tell you, it, um, in my case, I, I covered Iraq and Afghanistan for 12 years. And then I moved back to the U.S. And I would say, you know, I've been living in Kabul straight for those last two years. And, um, and I would say it took me about a week before I could go a day and forget there was a war on. And then I think I've been home three or four months. I could probably go like three days and not even occur to me that there was a war on. And if I could do that, having lived in that country and spent most of a dozen years bouncing around that region, I can't imagine how easy it is to just totally put it out of your mind for people who don't have skin in the game, don't have it, or don't think they do. They don't have a direct family connection to someone who's serving. And I think the fact that there's an all-volunteer force, which is a good thing in many ways, but it just means that much of the country is allowed and almost encouraged to check out. I think Congress as well, more or less checks out. They, they voted on these wars once, 18 years ago, and they just don't wanna put their name on it ever since. And you have, um, it, it just makes it very easy to separate yourself from what 
you are actually doing uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan or in Niger, which you might not even, not even know that there are uh, you know, U.S. special forces paid for with your tax dollars doing what your politicians have set them up to do in places all over the world. At some point, it might come back and bite you in the ass. That's one of my swears. Okay, yeah. Um, so like I have Alexa and do the morning brief and that's actually all my thing. So what is it? Corva Coleman? Is that her name? Yep. She's mm -hmm. a, so I, there is a little NPR. I'll there, tell Corva. So, yeah. so it's not, She's your, I don't entirely your, check out. I do a lot of reading <laughs> online. It's just, I don't have the nightly news like blaring every night. It's don't just, blame you. Don't yeah. Blame well, well, working at CBS, we put out a lot of, a lot of different shows and a lot of different news and, uh, uh it's exhausting staying on top of it all. It really is. And, uh, and you always want to, you see somebody in the hallway and you want to say, oh, Nikki, I saw your piece on this and that, you know. So, so there's a lot of incentive. And I still check out of the news a little bit sometimes, you know. Um, and it's, it's like, uh, you know, actually, okay, I was, one time I was on a layover in Nebraska or something like that. I was having a, I was having a drink at the bar and I got talking to a fella. And uh, he asked me how I came up in my career. And I told him about some of my conflict work. And, uh, and I told him what I'm doing now. And then so he asked me, well, do you get out to, uh, you know, do you cover a lot of politics, a lot of political news, you know? And I said, you know, honestly, I think I'm just too soft hearted for, 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 for political news. And, uh, and he said, uh, you'd rather be in Afghanistan than Washington. And I said, yeah, I think I would. <laughs> um, you know, the news today, it, it is, it does feel incredibly divisive. Um, and it's, it's because the world is more divisive. And I think that one of the things that happens, and I, I'm saying this as a problem without really presenting a solution, but one of the things that happens is it's like veterans have spent 18 years now uh, in, in a perpetual state of war fighting. And uh, obviously, you know, different people have deployed different amounts and it's affected them in different ways. But veterans are coming home to a nation that confuses them, a, a nation that, that it was like, we grew up in this very kind of, idealistic with at least in my experience I grew up with a very kind of idealistic understanding of america and and, and you come back and it, it feels um it feels scary it feels scary to think like well you know was any of this appreciated it, you know um does any of this is any of this contributing to the greatness of our of our people and our nation and 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 you know um does anybody even remember that we were there and it's 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 just, it feels scary and it feels frustrating and it feels, you know, lonely. Um, Carmen, I wonder if you want to talk about, I thought this was interesting, and um, Homa, the, the Afghani journalist, journalist who is here mm -hmm. um, this summer, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you edited uh, the story about um, oh, yeah, his experience. I know you right. had a long He's, conversation with right, him. Right, right. Um, could you talk about like what happened when he went here in Pittsburgh to do some reporting? He apparently um, was tasked with uh, talking to people on the streets here in downtown Pittsburgh. <clears throat> excuse me, about uh, Afghanistan and what they knew about Afghanistan, whether or not they were aware that there was still a war going on, what was happening to the Afghan people, et cetera, et cetera. And according to him, he had received um, some not very nice uh, remarks from folks about Afghanistan, about him being from Afghanistan. Um, some folks thought to call him names and to refer to him as these ugly terms that I won't repeat. But the fact of the matter is that there's a, I think that there's still a lot of misunderstanding about um, the people in Afghanistan um who are doing the fighting and who are caught in the middle the vast majority of people are just everyday citizens trying to make uh make it from one day to the next um they are caught up in, a, in decades of war they've known nothing else their children uh have limited access to education some if they're in rural places their their daughters have no access to education um or clean drinking water or all the amenities that we take for granted here um, and on top of that, they are all characterized by some people, including our president, of being terrorists. You know, I'm going to, you know, he made reference to to Afghanistan once, but I'm just going to bomb, bomb them into oblivion. Who? Who are these people that you're talking about that you're just going to 
wipe off the face of the earth. You know, the children just trying to play outside, you know, the, the opportunity when they can, when they're not being harassed or, or trying to be, uh, you know, co-opted into the Taliban. Like, who are these people? And in the video, just before you were, you were injured, mm -hmm. um, when the, is it IED exploded? Is that the right No, term? it was a, a rocket propelled okay. grenade. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Just before that, weren't you talking to some villagers and you're yeah. like, do you go to school? Like, I was what having do do? a conversation with them and um, I knew something was off because I could tell just from the vibe of being in this tiny village that something was awry and it turns out I was right. But um, yeah, we were just having a conversation. Hey, has the Taliban been through here? Are they trying to do this? Are they doing that? And, um, you know, I was having a very limited exchange. But yeah, it just looked very sad. Yeah. There are these people just sitting there. And it's like, what do you do? Do you go to school? Like they're, I didn't. They were young men. Uh, the opportunities are few and far between. We were a mile and a half from the Pakistani border in the mountains. There, there's really not much around other than farming and and um, the Taliban. So, um, you know, you can either grow crops or you can get paid to to shoot at American forces. Those are your opportunities. And just to add a little bit about Homa, uh, like he looks like his name is Humayun mm -hmm. Babur. And he was here because um, he reported in Afghanistan on, uh, I think it was a radio station. Mm -hmm. um, that got bombed pretty quickly after he reported on it. And so there were lots of death threats against him. So yeah. he's here trying to go back to Korea, you know, but he was doing a lot of reporting mm -hmm. while he was here. And um, yes, the, the story of him going to Market Square. And people said not <laughs> unkind things, but they also were like, yeah, is there a war? Yeah. He would say, you know, no, I don't know, you know, yeah. maybe yeah. Um, something going on over there. I don't, you know, it's and and like you mentioned, you know, many of us, including me, forget that we're touched by this. But yes, this is where a lot of our tax dollars are going. If if that's if <laughs> humanity aside, like caring about human beings, <laughs> like we are connected, we're I I would say culpable. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, well, the, in Afghanistan, it, it's it's strange uh, because, I mean, most of my Afghan friends, uh, my close friends there are uh, folks who speak English and they're, they're sort of Western looking, I guess you could say, or at least they're, um, you know, they're educated and uh, interested in a more modern society. There are, there's always been strong currents in Afghanistan that want to uh, return to their idea of a of a simpler life and a very strict religious code. But so my friends there are very grateful for America's arrival. Um, they're, uh, I guess, frustrated with the way things have gone. But there are, I mean, you should say there, were, there are definitely some advances that have been made in the time uh, that America's been there in terms of health and roads and um, just at the economy opening up. But, um, but the fact that the war is still going on, that uh, that many opportunities, I suppose, to uh, to negotiate or find a solution have been passed by or squandered. That, I mean, they find that frustrating. But I wouldn't say that they're um, uh, anti-American. They're still really hoping. I mean, for them, they're very concerned that the U.S. will leave and that the Taliban will just rush back in with the peace deal that was apparently on the table. At the end of the summer, uh, many Afghans I know were terrified that this was just going to mean, uh, you know, a power sharing agreement with the Taliban that would just fall apart as soon as American forces left. So it, it's um, it's something to think about. Yeah, do, is is our being there um, beyond what you said? Like our you know our tax dollars? What's it costing us? Is it in our is it in our national interests? What do we owe these people whose country we invaded and occupied? And um, or what do we owe our own soldiers? And do, do our citizens have an idea about why we're there, what the mission is, uh, you know, when we will have, have met that goal? I'm of two minds about it. Did, did you want to jump in at all, Russ? Um, you don't have to. You know, okay. I think that the, the larger point uh, in, the, in this, as far as our democracy here in America is, I think it's a huge problem that so many people are so ignorant of um, of what's of of really any of our foreign policy. I mean, uh, this Syria thing has been um, crazy this week, right? Uh, 
So, you know, um, and to me, I, I feel like um, my my industry, my organization, you know, you know, the press. I, I feel like we should take some accountability for that, and I think that we in the media should recognize that we have an important role in democracy, which is to educate and inform the citizenry so that they can make good decisions about our you know, national uh, policy and our future. And the fact that so few people are, are you know, they, they pulled, uh, you know, 50% of Americans last year were, were pulled who had no idea that we were engaged presently in any uh, uh, overseas conflicts. That is unbelievable. That is an enormous failure of communication. And so, you know, I don't know how to fix the whole thing, but I do know that probably having a few more veterans in newsrooms and in high ranking positions in the media, uh, I think that might be one start. Okay. Um, so we have, you know, we've talked about kind of the legacy media impact. Um, and I, Sean, you're like a storyteller, kind of. I guess so. <laughs> Sean brought this um, mounted poem that he did, and I said I would read a little bit of it. Um, I read it on Facebook, mm -hmm. and um, could you just tell me the story behind it when you read it and what you were going through? Yeah, and that kind so of thing? the background to that poem is so, like, you know, after I got out of the military, like, like, and in hindsight, like what I was going through was PTSD. Didn't know it at the time, but like my solution for a long time, for an extended probably six plus years, was was to drink, like a drink, and then you know all the all the meds that were pushed on me, like all that kind of stuff. Went through like a real rough. I also had like a hip replacement, back surgery. So to say I was in a bad spot would be kind of an understatement. So. After a while, after like things just continually getting worse, it was like, I can't drink anymore. Like I got sober. Like that was like really, it was kind of that or like kind of continue on until the bitter end, which wouldn't have been good. So like in my process of getting sober, it was like all these things that I'd been kind of like bearing down, like, you, you know, w w through drinking and whatever else w started to come back up. And I was like, I have to figure out a like healthy, productive, like, you know, non-destructive way to like deal with these feelings. And like, I started doing poetry, like doing, doing slam poetry. It's just, it really just started one day. It's like, I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to write. And I just like pulled out a pen and paper. And then I transitioned over to like doing it on my phone and then like in the notes on my phone. And so anyhow, like one day, this was almost like exactly four years ago. No. Yeah. Four years ago. So I would have been at that time, I would have been like, like eight months sober or something like that and i was having this day go, uh, going down the rabbit hole which is like a term like veterans use or i don't think just veterans but like you're kind of like in you know just remembering reminiscing you know all the tapes playing over and over in your head of like the terrible things that you experienced and like it's like i got to deal with this somewhat some some other way so i just pulled out my phone and just started like writing this poem out and like i that whole thing came out in probably like 30 minutes like then I edited it and you know changed a few things around, but like for the most part, that's exactly how it came out of my head. Um, also with like a little bit of a like heavy metal like background, it's more of a song if you will, but whatever, it's poems or songs is one and the same. So that so with that experience, and then later that night, it just so happened there was a poetry slam in my town, and I just went and performed it that night, and like what that kind of like did for me. Um, which, you know, going back to the whole storytelling piece and like why I believe it's important is like when you like get that stuff out and like whatever there's for me, there was like an, like an immense like catharsis that took place like it. And I've performed it live like three times. Like the first time I did it, like I was like shaking and like, like it was like real. It was like things inside of me were just like coming out that like that needed to like in order for me to like, like move on. I remember doing it. People in the in the crowd were like, they were like cheering, but they were also didn't know what to do because it's like super graphic and it's gory, but it's and it's really raw. And like I walked outside of the of the uh, of the place that it was at and just like sat there and kind of like shit shook for a little bit. And like and I did it like two more times live. And I remember like after I did it the third time, somebody was like, 
a friend, uh, a friend that I knew at the time was like, her friend had come up and said to her, it's like, what happened to that dude? And I remember it like hit me like, like a ton of bricks. It's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I, like, I don't want that to be my legacy, like living in that and continuing to like redo that poem. But like what that poem brought to me was like l the ability to let go of it. Like it didn't have the, cause after I did it a few times, it's like, it didn't have that same like visceral feeling for me. It was like, it no longer like captivated me. It no longer like had me enslaved to it. And so like, I kind of like, I was like, all right, like I'm done with this. And, and, but you know, just recently a, a friend was like, Hey, you should turn that into a piece of art. And that's kind of like what I did mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. So that was something I did a couple months ago or whatever, but like, I mean, that's kind of the story behind it. Thank but. you. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned, I thought it could be a Springsteen song. You know, that's what I heard whenever. Well, I, I just don't listen to metal. But yeah, the clash, I can see what yeah. you, it's, it's stronger than Springsteen, yeah. I think. Um, and if anybody, like, I feel like I'm trying to make this theme, but I don't know if I've articulated it well. But the theme here is like public storytelling, you know, so Sean there. And, and just all the ways um, that we connect with stories about veterans. And you and I were both at the Moth the other day. Yeah. And um, there was one woman who, who shared a story about her, her dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I just think like little things like that, um, you know, they're not the news, not a <laughs> magazine article. They're, but they really, like, they touch me in a way, oh, sorry, I'm touching the microphone, in a way that I don't, I don't you know, I mean, I'm not saying what, they're mutually, mutually exclusive, is that what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. But um, I just think there are all kinds of ways to learn, and for some of us, it's poetry, <laughs> and I appreciate that. So I'm going to read just a little bit of it. Um, and there is a, I guess people would say trigger warning, because it is, it is graphic. Um, there's blood, there's blood on the floor. I can't take, I can't take much more. Who knows what I'll see when I walk through that door, because there's blood, there's blood on the floor. The screaming and crying, I watch my friends dying. Sights I can't erase, where the fuck is his face? He's losing blood, his legs are gone. Till his last breath, it won't be too long. So it goes on. Um, and, you know, my ideal would be that we could, after the event, you know, maybe put some of this on oh, yeah, uh, sure. Facebook if yep. you're okay with that and share it. And you, were the, you led a medical team? So, yeah, I was a med medical service corps officer and a med uh, medical platoon leader. So, like, my job there was to, and actually, I had two jobs at the, at the same time. I was also, the headquarters uh, company executive officer. So when I wasn't doing all the logistics stuff, like basically every time like we had, we had casualties come in, I'd run from one side of the base to the other side. And that's why I talk about like walking through the door because if the casualties were already there, that's what I would walk into, you know, like blood on the floor, so to speak. Um, and yeah, so that's what I did. Um, so we have about nine minutes and I wondered if um, you all wanted to jump in on um, how how we can consume news about uh, veterans in the military like what what are your ways of doing that Carmen I mean are you a TV watcher or are you like no. how do you okay <laughs> Um, I have, Sorry, it's fun. <laughs> that's okay. I used to work at CBS too. Okay. I, 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 that's why I recognize where he's sitting. Okay. Um, uh, I often have people ask me what news, uh, they should be watching, um, because they're not getting the real news. And that's how I know that they're not really not serious about consuming news because they should be reading and they should be listening, of course, but reading for the context, uh, to really get into the nuts and bolts of a, of a story, something as complex as the war in Afghanistan or in Iraq or wherever U.S. forces are, or for the lives of those who've done this fighting and sacrificing. I feel like you can listen to uh, your work, but you need to complement that listen with some additional reading. Um, if you're really passionate, if you really care about something, if something that you've heard or you have watched moves you, I would hope that it would move you to go and do a little research, do a little more reading. I often have people tell me, oh, the reason we don't know about the war is that the war is never on the front page of the paper. I'm thinking, what's the front page? There's no front page. Just because it's, 
you have this physical entity where your local news outlet decides to put certain stories. That doesn't mean that those other stories aren't available. A hundred stories about Afghanistan come out of Afghanistan every single day. And there's really easy to find. It's in your pocket, that story. Go on your phone. Everything you need to know is right there. Um, and, and dig. And, and so it, you, I can't download this information into your brain. You have to do a little bit of the work. So when people say to me, well, it's never on the news. Okay. Well, that's not, shouldn't be your only source of news. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't have any sympathy for that question of all. Well, how can I find out about this? It really takes almost no effort. I mean, maybe you, there's some uh, skills that need to be learned in terms of figuring out what you consider a reliable news source. I, um, I, the other question that I get, which mystifies me, is what, you know, what's the real story? What's the stuff you're not telling us? It's like, well, you know, Carmen risked his life to tell you. You think he's going to keep the story to himself? He's, you go out there and you get the story, and the whole point is to get it on the air. I never have anyone tell me, oh, you can't run that. That's too, you know, that doesn't fit our politics or anything like that. And I can say downrange, uh, in that meaning in uh, foreign correspondence in Iraq and Afghanistan, it didn't matter if you were Fox News or MSNBC or NPR or the New York Times, really everyone was just straight up trying to figure out what was going on and report it back. Editorial pages are a different thing. Um, but uh, this whole idea that there's a lot of fake news out there, don't have much sympathy for that either. I think it's with a little bit of work and finding you know, reputable sources that have been doing this for a long time and that when they make their errors, they correct them. That's all you need. And, and it, it doesn't take much effort to find news about Afghanistan. If you want to go find specific veterans news, there are all sorts of great uh, publications. Task and Purpose is one or uh, all of the, uh, you know, the Military Times or the Stars and Stripes, those sort of papers that get deep in the weeds. If you're, and, and then there's even the military version of The Onion, which is the duffel blog which is hilarious. <laughs> and so if, if, you, if you're the kind of person who goes for their news through sort of an old, you know, like you used to watch John Stewart or you read The Onion, there's even that. So uh, just th there's really, it, it's out there and it's, it's easy to find. Quill, I love that you referenced uh, Task and Purpose and Duffel Blog, but both of which uh, uh, have a, a heavy leadership from uh, Paul Zoldra. Um, who he founded the Duffel Blog and he's presently the editor and, and chief of, uh, of Task and Purpose. And uh, Paul's, Paul's on our board at Military Veterans and Journalism. And one of the things that he talks about is, um, you know, overcoming your bias and how well prepared veterans are to do that. Because, you know, his experience, he was an intern at Business Insider when the uh, when, when it, uh, Boston Marathon bombing happened. And he describes a story where everybody is transfixed for a moment on the TV screen happening. And then they got down to work. They're making calls and they're being journalists. And, you know, in journalism, we call that objectivity. It's where you're able to separate your own emotions from something to tell a story. OK, um, but but Paul saw it as a, as a soldierly virtue, meaning this is what this is what he and his Marines would do. The difference being that that you know something happens and your thought is that you're protecting your, your marines or, or or whomever you're serving with rather than than th that you're informing the public but the biases that we bring to the things that we're reading have a big impact on how we interpret them um and i, I mean i read lots of fake news all the time i love to read fake news i, I read fake news I, I read real news you know um i i like to hear every different perspective and i and i like to try and you know um you know, and, and, and by the way, I, I like to read a lot of stuff that's 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 not very well established or hasn't been around very long. One great example for for news about, you know, storytelling about war fighters is uh, Thomas Brennan has uh, a war horse and that's new and it's incredible. You know, um, those sources are out there and um, and, you know, uh, th those things make me happy. So the information is available and a lot more people have a voice now where they didn't before. Uh, you know, there's a real democratization of information. Um, it's dangerous and it's scary, but overall, I think it's good for the world. And I think that it's bringing us to a better place. We have a, thank you. We have about three minutes left. And um, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm, I'm doing, offering workshops to people with disabilities. Um, hopefully we'll have a group of uh, veterans and maybe Carmen will come by and be a mentor. 
Sure. You agreed to it on tape. That's okay. what I wanted. <laughs> uh, in with witnesses. So, um, but what advice would you give? To you know, a, my goal would be a veteran is coming here, wanting to do a podcast or you know wanting to express whatever about their experience and also learn and maybe bring somebody else to the studio and and get more information. So, what advice might you give? Would you want to start, Quill? Uh, advice to someone who wants to get into media? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be media. Maybe it's interviewing. Maybe it's a maybe there's a question about interviewing veterans and, and trying to get the most out of that. Uh, I mean, with, veterans are just like other people who've mm -hmm. they've had a job like other people. Yeah. It might be a, have involved, you know, like firemen or police it involved a little bit more kind of. Uh, occasional mortal danger, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I'm just, there's a this idea that veterans are, they're all heroes and they're also all psycho, ticking time bombs. Neither of those things are true. Um, so they're just regular folks and just ask, what the, as long as your questions aren't kind of prurient, like, did you ever kill anybody? Uh, if you aren't, you know, going to start off with what, that sort of salacious stuff, if you're sincere about wanting to know that person's story, I have al I've almost never had uh, any trouble. Just ask what what makes you curious, and um, and each question will lead to another question. And um, yeah, I don't. I think interviewing veterans isn't the the whole point about interviewing veterans is it's no different from interviewing anyone else. And um, since you've been working on the podcast, like somebody who might want to start a podcast or might want to help with your podcast, a yes, right. Um, what are some of the things they can expect or, or what, what's been hard about doing the podcast, I guess? Um, sometimes when a veteran interviews another veteran, they fall into that veteran lingo <laughs> acronym speak that I can't even keep up with. And I spent years and years around it. And sometimes I have to stop them and say, guys, nobody knows what the hell you're talking about right now. Um, you have to realize, you have to start from the supposition that people don't know the difference between a soldier and a Marine. They don't know the difference between the Army and the Marines, or the they don't know the branches, they don't know the ranks, they don't know anything. So try to convey to them not the um, the, 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 the lingo, but the, the emotion of, of the experience. Um, I think that there's, there's more, uh, heart and humanity uh, among the veterans I've spoken to than among many of other folks to, to uh, I've interviewed over the years. Um, that That's what's going to resonate with a, with a larger audience rather than you talking about what kind of tank or vehicle you were riding in to this particular location to fight this battle and blah, blah, blah. That's my Thank point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sean, like somebody starting media and, and wanting to look into these issues like do you have something that you think doesn't happen that you would like to see people get out there no i i can't think of anything that okay. i don't think is happening okay. or, or that i'd like to see like and okay. and just to like i'm i do stay informed it's just like it's just not the <laughs> nightly news so like, we <laughs> i think we all understand okay. we appreciate okay. that you're talking to alexa about this yes <laughs> every day actually she's talking to me yes just... alexa <laughs> Well, you're reaching out. Yeah, you're true. reaching out. Um, Whatever you want to do, you know, don't wait for somebody to hire you. Just do it. And if you make it great, then then uh, it's gonna it's gonna bring you places. And uh, as you start to build your skills, figure out what you like and specialize in something. You know, everybody who starts out at the bottom of an organization, you know, I, I mean, I'm always railing on about how you know uh, we hire these people and we turn them into interns. They have all this experience, but the truth is that if you, uh, you know, if you have 20 years of business leadership and you go into the and you go into the the army, they're not going to make you like a lieutenant colonel, right? Like you, you do have to start somewhere. So so sometimes you have to kind of accept that you have to start at the bottom. But if you specialize in something, if you can do something, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's for me, it was technical field production. For other people, it might be you know immigration courts in in, in Pennsylvania, right? But if you specialize in something and you're the only person in the room that can do that certain thing, then you're never going to have get stuck with busy work because you're always going to be very essential in your specialty. Those are some of my thoughts on that. I have gifts for you. 
Thank that you. I don't normally like to show people. I'm giving a gift, but these are so cool. Um, Sword and Plow is this company, and they didn't pay me or anything, that makes um, their repurposed fabric, like surplus military fabric. Mm. And these are like eyeglass, sunglass holders, oh, whatever you'd like. Excellent. And and it's a veteran-owned business. So, cool. and and I'll send you yeah. one, Russ. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just thought that's, they were great. So and and yeah. yeah, perfect. So um, thank you, Russ Midori, uh, military veteran. Russ, I'm in New York too. Hit me up, okay? Cool. You're also in. Yeah, you're in New York with on uh, NPR. Uh, Carmen Gentile. You can f can we find your work on Post Industrial? Sure. And also your website, CarmenGentile dot com. Correct. Um, Sean Tyler. Also, thank yep. you for being here. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for audience and you know, Point Park. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. Thanks. If we clap, it won't be a smattering of applause. Like, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was nice.